so I'm really, really excited to be back in person in this hybrid format. Uh, uh, we're planning to do a couple of these events. So today's event is sort of a joint uh, event between IAIM, so that's the Institute for Augmented Intelligence and Medicine, and IFAM. Uh, and so uh, we're going to bring to you a couple different events over the next few months. Uh, in particular, the hybrid events will be ones that have uh, aspects of technology, which also may have societal or social implications like uh, our speaker today. So Dr. Udenberg, I was really lucky to meet uh, Stefan uh, at a conference we were both at, uh, an Ignite conference out somewhere in the Western, I don't know where it was, by the O'Hare or something like that. And it was about uh, novel technologies that could have uh, potential, like industry potential or could have spin-off potential. Uh, and we were really struck at that time by uh, the novelty, the innov innovativeness of his work, uh, but also the implications of that work. And so we thought we'd just invite him here and give a little talk. Uh, Dr. Udenberg, has a, I think you've taken a tour of a majority of the, uh, I think, uh, Ivy League schools, it sounds like. I think you were at, uh, looks like Yale, Dartmouth, then Yale, then Princeton. And now he's a principal investigator over at uh, Booth School of Business. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, facial a representation, how that might uh, bias us. So thank you for coming and speaking. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? The Zoom people can also hear me, I, I would hope. Um, they let me know. Um, so welcome, it's great to be here. My name is Stefan. I'm a principal researcher at Booth. Um, and I am a cognitive psychologist by training. So I'm a vision scientist that studies questions that are often in the domain of social psychology. I'm interested in how we see and remember and think about other people, but I take a vision science perspective onto these kinds of questions. And my work is generally about revealing the default assumptions that we have about other people and other faces. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you mostly about the work that I've done as a detour to that, to enable those kinds of lines of work. Um, and I'm gonna start with a little uh, demo. Suppose that you've just moved to a new state or country, you're at the DMV, you're trying to get your driver's license switched over, but the forms are very, very confusing and you don't know what to do. These, assuming that this works, are the only two people in front of you. So the question is, who would you rather ask for help? These are the only two clicks available. It's laughable, right? It's laughable because it's obvious who you'd rather approach. Uh, if you're anything like the participants in our studies in any case, because the person on the right just gives some sense that they're more friendly, more warm, more approachable. And we make these kinds of uh, judgments about people's faces all the time, because when you look at a face, you can't help but read it. There are features that you read out of faces, like uh, more objective features like age, for example, how old someone looks, we're pretty good at doing that. And then there are features that you read into faces, things that you think a person is like as a person, right? How trustworthy you think they are, how dominant you think they are. And these kinds of uh, reading into faces, these kinds of features can be misleading and inaccurate and biased, um, but we do it nonetheless. Um, this has a, this idea that you can read out what, kinds, what, what kind of person someone is just based on how they look has a long, long, long and um, dark history within psychology and pseudoscience more generally. Um, the idea is called physiognomy. It goes all the way back to Aristotle. You can find it in other cultures as well. Um, but it got really, really popular in the West with this guy, um, Lavater. He sold many, 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 many uh, publications or prints of his um, treatise on physiognomy, right? This is the idea that you can tell how, um, how good a leader someone is going to be based on the shape of their nose or based on the prominence of their jaw or something like that. And we now know that this sort of thing is nonsense pseudoscience and doesn't work and you can't actually tell um, how good a leader is someone is going to be based on what their jaw looks like. But this idea remains very, very popular. You can still find um, popular films sort of exploring this kind of idea. So this was a film from a few years, from about 10 years ago now, I suppose, called The Face Reader um, from South Korea. Uh, there was an interesting... Um, quote that I had from there. So apparently in this film, um, they said that the ears tell you the most about a person. And I quote, since you listen to others with your ears, you can tell through looking at the ears whether or not a person is spiteful or good natured. And if they are respectful to others' opinions, said Lee Hyun, fortune teller at the fortune telling establishment, Gung Hap story. You can also tell whether they're strongly opinionated, even whether or not they have a good sex life. All of this from looking at your ears. Um, 
I don't believe that's the case, but we can make fun of these kinds of ideas, and yet we're all naive physiognomists in some sense. We all make judgments of other people based on their faces on a daily basis. Um, so how does this work? A lot, of these, the psycho a lot of the psychological science around this stuff is about characterizing and elucidating these biases and trying to combat them. So what have we learned? For one, we know that these kinds of impressions are very, very fast. You can make them in half the time it takes to blink your eye. So I can show you a face for as little as 50 milliseconds or less, take it away, and you've already made a stable judgment of what, that, um, what you think that person is like in terms of how trustworthy they look, in terms of how dominant you look, they look. Any feature that anybody has ever asked anything of faces seems to be done in terms of visual processing by about the 50 millisecond mark. People are very, very consistent when it comes to that. Um, we know that these kinds of impressions matter a great deal, but they can, in fact, be misleading. So this is work from my advisor back in the day in 2005, showing that you can predict election outcomes just on the basis of photographs. So whichever of the two people looks more competent in a given Senate race is more likely to win elections. You can predict the election about two thirds of the time to 70% of the time, just on the basis of the photograph. Forget about policy, forget about anything else, just, just the photograph. And this is not unique to adults. You can actually do this with kids. So in one of our favorite replications of this kind of work, Swiss children can predict French parliamentary outcomes in the past, before they were born, <laughs> right? About seven out of 10 times, which is to say people are making these kinds of judgments regularly. It has real world impacts. Um, and in basically all kinds of domains, wherever people have looked at this stuff. So for example, military cadets at West Point uh, end up with higher military ranks over the course of their careers on the basis of how they look. The more dominant looking ones end up with higher ranks. We know that more competent looking CEOs end up earning more in their compensation packages, even if they aren't actually more competent as measured by various forms of, um, I don't know, business outcomes. Uh, and we know that trustworthy looks benefit borrowers. So there was an online lending platform called Prosper. Um, people with more trustworthy looking faces end up being more likely to be approved for loans and to get lower interest rates. Um, so because these kinds of things happen, because these kinds of uh, impacts are disparate, we want to try and understand where they come from and model them so that we can then study them with greater fidelity and aim to combat them. One of the interesting aspects of this is that these kinds of impressions are shared. People agree for the most part on who looks trustworthy or dominant or smart or whatever have you. And because of that, you can leverage that, uh, that insight to try and figure out what is going on, right? What are the features that drive these impressions? But this is a really, really hard problem in general. If you want to model different aspects of faces, you've got a potentially infinite feature space to deal with, right? Like how big is the nose? How far apart are the eyes? How big are the eyes? What colors are they, et cetera, right? And if you just imagine you've got even just a small set of binary facial features, present or not, right? If you've just got 10 binary features, you've got 10,024 combinations you've got to deal with. If you've got 20, you've got over a million features to deal with. And most facial features aren't binary, present or not. They're on a, some kind of sliding scale, right? Like how wide is your nose? How full are your lips, et cetera? So it's a hard problem. It's one that in the past people have tried to explore. So this is from a British uh, painter way back in the day who tried to experiment with different profiles of faces, right? So he had like different types of eyes and different types of ears. Um, and he's trying to depict different types of beauty. So the one in the middle is supposed to be quote unquote simple beauty. And then the other ones on the sides are steady or languid or artful or penetrating. Don't ask me which is which. I couldn't tell you which of these is meant to evoke steady beauty versus languid beauty. Um, but the point is that these explorations were uh, interesting but not particularly um, fruitful scientifically. Um, because like just with this, the few numbers of uh, features that he had, four different types of forehead, two different types of noses, et cetera. There were over 294,000 possible profiles he could have drawn. Um, I think he ended up drawing less than 100 of them because what person could devote themselves to monastically 
drawing out all these different profiles and then testing their own introspective uh, judgments of these things. So what we do is we take a more computational bottom-up data-driven approach to modeling what about faces is driving people's impressions. Um, so what you can do is you can leverage physical face models, right? So imagine you've got a bunch of laser scans of people's heads, let's say 300 laser scans of people's heads. This is a model from Blanz and Vetter. Um, and you do, you're able to make like a, a mathematical description of these faces in, in three-dimensional space. Um, and eventually do PCA to reduce these representations down to just 100 numbers. So you've got 50 numbers that represent the shape of the face and 50 numbers that represent the coloration and texture of the face, um, giving you a, a nice statistical uh, physical model of a face. So you can do things like represent any given face as a point in this face space. Okay, Face spaces are a very um, useful model in, in, in psychology for understanding how, how faces are represented. So any given face can be thought of as a, as a point in the space, which allows you to do basically just matrix math on them. You can, you can morph between faces this way, uh, et cetera. Um, and you can do this with, say, shape. You can do this with the coloration or reflectance of the faces as well. So you've got 50 of each. Um, and this allows you to combine faces and explore the, the nature of the space. But once you've got this physical space, you can then try to map it onto impression space as well. So what you can do is you can make a bunch of random faces, right? Because they're all just points in this, in this space. So you make a bunch of random faces that are all just 100 random numbers each. And for every one of those faces, you just, ask, you just ask people, how X does this face look? Where X is some perceived dimension of interest, right? How trustworthy does this face look? How dominant does this face look? And given those ratings, you then basically just do linear regression on uh, the on those ratings using the hundred variables that describe the face as predictors. So using that, you've got now a vector of whatever dimension you've just asked people about, just from um, several thousand ratings of faces. So for example, this is um, proof of that. You can take this model of quote unquote perceived trustworthiness. Where I'm going to take the face and I'm going to morph it such that it looks more and more quote unquote trustworthy. Notice it becomes more feminine, more smiley. And then we're going to make it look less and less, quote unquote, trustworthy. Um, it becomes more masculine, more scowly, more scary. Um, and this just falls out of the data. None of these faces in particular were shown to people in the experiments. This is just to say, this is what people think trustworthiness looks like, which is, again, different from what real life trustworthiness looks like, which may not be a thing you can actually get out of faces, OK, in case that wasn't clear. This is a model of, quote unquote, perceived dominance. I'm going to make it look more and more, quote unquote, dominant. Um, and then less and less so as we move back through the space. Um, so this is all to say that these models are good. They work well. Um, they're very evocative. And they have a lot of advantages to this kind of approach more generally. Um, one is that it's doable, right, insofar as you, you can't possibly model a gazillion different binary features. Um, Similarities between models is super, super apparent, right? So trustworthiness looks a lot like attractiveness in these kinds of models because you can they all share the same physical space that describes everything. So you can see just by exploring the, the data, just by looking at it, you can discover some interesting things about how we think about other people. Um, you can use these to explore all kinds of interesting questions as people have done. For example, looking at gender bias in perceptions of competence. Um, and you can also use these kinds of methods to build uh, models using other metrics. So for example, if you want to know um, what a particular neuron or neuronal population is tuned towards in faces, you could use that. Instead of asking people about ratings, you can just look at neural firings and use that to create a dimension that best captures the, the neuronal firing rates. Um, and so in general, when you're studying face perception or biases in face perception, you've got two major approaches. And on the one hand, you've got the kinds of models that I showed you, which have been used by hundreds of labs all around the world to answer all sorts of important deep questions about people and how we see and remember them and think about them. But there are some limitations. Uh, one is that they don't look particularly realistic. They are bald heads, disembodied on uniform backgrounds. Um, 
they're not particularly diverse. They were made from mostly, you know, laser scans of white people's heads. Um, and because they're not very realistic, it's difficult to convince people that they are real people and to do studies that may require, um, require those beliefs, um, as in, for example, like economic games or something. On the other hand, you could use real people's faces. So these are faces taken from the Chicago face database, uh, taken down at UChicago. And these are real people. You don't have any trouble convincing people that these are real people. Um, them. Oh yeah, go ahead. What do you need? I'm trying to get rid of that thing because it's sort of cutting it off. Oh, at the top. Yeah, I can. I don't see it. It's I can. Fine. I can try. I can move it. Um, it's cutting it off a little bit, but it's okay. You know, I think you'd have to get out of that. Yeah, it'll be rough. Okay, no worries. Um, but controlling these stimuli is very, very difficult. So suppose I want to know about the impact of race as opposed to gender on certain um, uh, societal outcomes. For me to go and like manipulate the gender of a given face is gonna be more difficult. It's, I'm gonna need to go into Photoshop, it's gonna be harder. Suppose I wanna know about like eye size or any number of things, it becomes difficult to control. Um, so I wanted to kind of cut the Gordian knot and to have methods that would allow me to have hyper-realistic faces that are super diverse, that allowed me to uh, manipulate the attributes of faces that I need in order to run the studies that I run. So uh, if you recall these faces from the very beginning of the talk, this is where I make the big reveal that these faces actually aren't real um, and they never were. And they were created using our models of, um, of perceived trustworthiness here. Um, was there anybody who realized beforehand that these weren't real or if you could raise your hand in the audience? No, okay. Um, so these were used, these were created using a kind of um, model that you may be familiar with. It's called StyleGAN. It was in the news a few years ago um, as an AI that creates fake faces. And out of the box, you can do some pretty interesting things with it. For example, you can morph faces along all sorts of different dimensions. Um, you can create novel faces, realistic faces, diverse faces, but it's very much a black box insofar as it's like playing with a, a slot machine. You pull on the lever and out comes a face, but that face could look like a 45-year-old uh, Asian lady with glasses who's smiling. It could look like an eight-year-old white child with a hat. It could be anything. So my work aims to put reins on these sorts of models so that we can do interesting things with them. Um, so our goals were, one, to be able to easily generate realistic, diverse faces that we can vary along any given uh, attribute of interest. Two is to be able to transform any given face photograph along these dimensions. And three is to, as a corollary, we would be able to predict uh, judgments of any given face photo for a, for a given population that we, we sample from. And in case it wasn't crystal clear from the rest of the talk, we're talking about judgments of faces here. We're not talking about ground truth. Um, in practice, I don't think it's really possible to uh, create physiognomic models of faces that give you anything of interest that allow you to predict how good someone is going to be at a job or how likely they are to pay back a bank loan. This is kind of doing the opposite. Instead of saying, based on your face, you should get a bank loan, it's saying, because of your face, you're not getting bank loans. Why is that? How can we actually combat that? What does that mean? What is driving that, uh, that discrimination you're facing? So to start, we looked at 34 different perceived attributes, most of which were already in the literature in one form or another, like that were theoretically motivated, like trustworthiness or dominance. But we also added a bunch that um, were kind of off the wall that we were interested in, like what does a privileged face look like? Or what does a dorky face look like or something? Um, and the way it works is that we generated, it's the same sort of approach that I, that I glossed over earlier. Each of these faces can be thought of as a, as a set of numbers. There's just 512 numbers. So we generate a bunch of these faces at random. This is just a, a small sampling of these. We generated over a thousand. But you can see there's like all kinds of different faces here. Young faces, old faces, white faces, black faces. And for any given one of these faces, we just ask people, how X does this face look? On a scale of say, not at all to extremely. And then people can click on the slider to say what they think. And they do this for 100 different faces. And then we just do linear regression because every given face can be thought of as just a, a list of 512 numbers. And we can then use those as predictors 
um, to uh, infer what's driving the mean ratings of these faces. If that's clear, if there's any questions, feel free to um, ask as we go along. I'm fine to take questions at both. I can't get past the first slide without being bombarded with questions. <laughs> so it's okay if you have any. Um, at the high level overview for this project, we uh, recently published it in PNAS about, I guess, 10 months ago now, uh, across over 10,000 participant sessions from over 4,000 unique participants. We collected over a million ratings for these attributes on over 1,000 images to be able to model these sorts of things. And I can show you all kinds of graphs about how good the faces, how, how good these models work and all the variance it captures, et cetera, but seeing is believing, and I think a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, so this is a picture of perceived age. Um, notice how the faces on the left look less old than the faces on the right. And some interesting things happen as well, where often as we more faces to become more quote unquote old looking, they grow glasses, they grow glasses in the model. Uh, we did not vary glasses having this as a, as a particular feature in the model. This is all bottom up entirely based on the statistical uh, latent face space. This is what quote unquote trustworthiness looks like to our participants. And I should note, our participants are a convenience sample of uh, people on Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is uh, the most popular platform used for collecting behavioral data online. Um, as a result, the population is more diverse than a college campus, but less, slightly less representative than the, than the real United States. Um, it's, I think our sample was about 70% white or something and various other kinds of groups. So what is this is what quote unquote trustworthiness looks like. Uh, some of this isn't rocket science in the sense that we expected to find it, right? More smiley, more feminine, but other things kind of stood out to me. One of them being eye direction, eye gaze. Um, looking at the camera makes the faces look more trustworthy. Another one was the, uh, not just eyebrow shape, but also the background. The background becomes more saturated and more colorful, the more quote unquote trustworthy the faces um, are made to look. This is what quote unquote smartness looked like to our participants. Notice they don't think that sleepy kids, younger kids are smart, <laughs> but they do think that, <laughs> that older, uh, somewhat smiley adults are. And it may affect faces differently depending on their starting point in the latent space. So the, ma the masculine faces can end up looking a bit older, whereas the feminine faces don't get quite as old, the, the smarter that you make them look. This is again, reflecting the biases held by the population that we're studying. This is one of my favorite um, little demos. This is what quote unquote outgoingness looked like, um, which isn't rocket science, more, sm more smiley looking people look more outgoing to our participants. But if you notice the woman in sunglasses at the bottom, so if you start off with glasses, sunglasses, the glasses become brighter, they become rounder, they, they become bigger, they pop out of the face more. Um, which I was not at all expecting. Um, and this is just one little video demo of a morph going from less quote unquote uh, trustworthy looking to more so as we morph through the space. And just notice all the different kinds of things that change. Um, so in conclusion, I believe we can now generate, manipulate and infer dozens of different perceived attributes from faces. This is limited only by the uh, data that we can collect. You do need lots of data for any given face, but given the scale of data collection, you can literally collect it within an, an afternoon for a given attribute. And I find that surprising features drive these impressions from time to time. And this is ultimately a way that I've developed or my team and I have developed in order to explore our biases. There's a lot of talk about bias in AI, about biased AI models, but this kind of flips the logic on its head. These are not merely biased AI models, they are AI models of bias that allow us to basically put a microscope onto the mental representations people have of different groups of different ideas. And so there's a lot of things we're currently exploring with these techniques. One is memorability. What makes a face actually more likely to be remembered? by people out in the world, or face photograph, I should say. Because these, again, are not faces. These are face photographs. To make that clear, I can take a, you've, you, you must have taken pictures of yourself where you've taken a good picture and a bad picture, right? You can transform how other people look at you in a photograph by four or five standard deviations just by smiling or frowning, right? So we're looking at how memorability actually manifests in photographs. We're looking at how 
uh, reputation manages to propagate in systems. So given that your face looks a certain way, maybe you're like given fewer opportunities in order to participate in a marketplace, which leads to getting fewer reviews, which leads to less overall uh, compensation and, and good outcomes in the long run, just from initial starting conditions. We're looking at different, uh, how impressions are um, formed in general. We're creating developmental data sets. So one of these things is that one of the issues with psychology is that it's very hard when dealing with privacy concerns of using pictures of kids, of using pictures of, of children and babies. So this is another avenue that potentially this could do some help because none of the kids' faces are really of kids. They never existed. So there's no privacy concerns there that I know of. And I'm interested in the real world outcomes of these kinds of biases in the world. What kinds of photographs are people swiping right or left on in dating apps? What kinds of people are getting uh, recruitment messages on LinkedIn? How are political campaigns being affected by these kinds of um, uh, biases over and above what we've already seen in the, in the past literature, right? Where if you just show people headshots of politicians, you can predict outcome seven out of 10 times. I'm curious about what's going on in the news. How does Fox News represent Joe Biden versus how does CNN represent Joe Biden or vice versa for the likes of Trump? Um, and I'm just beginning to think about this stuff. This is very much hyper nascent, uh, sort of prompted by this invitation, but I'm thinking about ways in which uh, you could use either these models or the insights from them for potential health applications. So I'll just lead with a couple of findings that I found very, very interesting in the field more generally. Um, this is a little demo. Of these two faces, who do you think looks the more attractive? If you had to just shout it out. If it's the left, raise your hand. And if it's the right, raise your hand. Okay, so the one on the left is after a good night's sleep. And the one on the right is of the same person after he's been sleep deprived for 31 hours. Um, so your health shows up on your face because your face is part of your body. Um, so even if your face can't tell you whether or not you're gonna cheat on an exam, maybe it could tell you whether or not you've, you're getting hydrated well, you're getting good night's sleep, you're exercising enough. Um, this, for example, is one of my, one of my favorite uh, demos. These are pictures, these are, these are composite images. Okay, so these are composite images of twins. And the one on the left is a composite image of the twins that look younger. And the one on the right is a composite image of the twins that look older. Um, and these are Danish twins, uh, many, many hundreds of them over 70. Um, I'm actually not sure how many are represented in the composite image, but the study was done on hundreds and hundreds of Danish twins in their 70s. And they looked at what predicted mortality in these twins. And the best predictor is just how old are you, right? Your actual chronological age is, is, is the best predictor. But just as strong was how old you looked. So looking younger is a signal in some way of, of good health um, because maybe you're exercising enough, maybe you're eating well, maybe you're getting lots of carotenoids, um, et cetera. So I'm curious as to the implications of this, just in the health domain more generally, you could imagine a personalized model of your own face that you've, maybe you've taken lots of selfies over the course of your life, let's say. And on a day-to-day -day basis, you might be able to use your face as some kind of indicator of what is going on with the general state of your body, right? Cameras are in everybody's pockets now, but the ability to take your heart rate is not in everybody's pocket. The ability to um, read out your lipids is not. So this may be a cheap and interesting way forward that people can use their own faces, not necessarily trained on other people's data and aggregate, but something about you can be used for personalized healthcare is a thought. Um, this is all hyper, hyper nascent. I'm not an expert in this field. Um, I'm also interested in the possibility of modeling pain perception. So we know from various lines of work that Doctors have a hard time either seeing or recognizing or taking seriously the pain in other race faces, for example. Um, and I think that it's maybe possible to mitigate that one way or another. One way I could think of is making models that really do 
measure the ground truth of pain in faces as opposed to just impressions. And you could imagine giving doctors the ability to just snap a picture of someone and it reads, gives them a score that they can read out, right? So they don't have to trust their own subjective uh, biased impression of how much pain this person is actually in. Another possibility is that you train them. You just train them on the breadth and depth of pain experiences in people from all kinds of different backgrounds. And it allows them to build a more, to build the model in their own head, right? So rather than rely on a machine learning model out, out on some you know, Azure cloud service somewhere to become a better clinician and become more connected with the patients that you see. Um, and one last possibility is that uh, I could see, this, this, is, this is kind of where things are going in some sense. Um, and I grapple with it, whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing, but basically with the rise of machine learning, AI, deep fakes, et cetera, we're gonna to get to a point where it becomes very difficult to trust video more generally. Um, but I could imagine uh, sort of intermediary filters or um, attributes that you could use in order to, to foster greater doctor-patient trust. So imagine, we know, for example, that, uh, so let me, let me just zoom in a little bit so you could see a little bit better, assuming I can zoom. So for example, we know that faces that look more trustworthy looking when, a, when attached to these doctor bodies, forgive that these are the old kinds of models, um, bald heads on, on blank backgrounds, but the more trustworthy looking faces end up um, basically making patients feel less pain, right? So in this study, they're administering noxious heat to patients or to, to subjects in an fMRI scanner and measuring their brain responses. When they pair that noxious heat with more trustworthy looking faces, the patients report experiencing less pain than when they pair them with more untrustworthy looking faces. If I can move over to the left, like these. Um, so I can imagine a world in which doctors are not, like via telehealth, are not necessarily treating patients directly with their raw face. They're using some kinds of filters to augment what they look like in order to foster greater bedside manner with the patients. Alternatively, you could imagine training them to, uh, to move their face in such a way that they do foster such greater bedside manner. But that leads into questions of authenticity and all sorts of things. So I'm still grappling with that, but I can see that definitely being something that comes out, whether or not I am involved in that in any way, because it does make me feel a little bit odd. Um, uh, in the meantime, in the coming months, we hope to release an API for the use of the broader scientific community to answer all kinds of questions that they may have about biases and faces. And if you find yourself in downtown Chicago, which you all are in this room, um, we actually have a museum. It's called MindWorks. It's off of Michigan Avenue. It's obliquely opposite the Art Institute of Chicago. And there you can actually uh, learn about all kinds of decision-making phenomena and the like. That's what it was designed for. But there, there is a photo booth. And at the photo booth, you can learn about the science of first impressions. You can take a picture of yourself and morph yourself along these different dimensions. Learn why it's not a good idea to judge people based on their based on a snapshot in time on their faces. Um, and to preview what is to come, these techniques are not really face specific. They can be used for anything under the sun. So I'm hoping to, to create models of poses and bodies and fashion and voices um, <clears throat> to explore impressions of all kinds of different stimuli. What makes a car look fast? What makes a shoe look sexy? What makes a bicycle look I don't know, uh, like a good buy, let's say. So for example, this is a model that we trained on uh, 2D schematics of bicycles. These are just random bikes in that latent space. And so we can already like morph between bikes and begin to explore what is driving impressions of say bicycles. This is just to show that this is a, a general phenomenon. So broadly speaking, my work studies the visual roots of social cognition. I try to take a cognitive science and vision science perspective on questions that are typically in the domain of social psychologists. And it is my hope that this kind of work can bridge the gap between different kinds of psychology and have an and AI and have an impact on potentially other disparate fields as well, not just political science or something, but also potentially healthcare. Um, if you're interested in this kind of work, I'm actually starting a lab next August, not this August, but the following August. Um, 
and I'll be looking to recruit students and the like, and possibly lab managers and postdocs and things. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to contact me. And I just wanted to thank all my different collaborators um, on this work, Josh, Jordan, and Tom, uh, all at print, actually, Jordan is now at Stevens Institute of Technology. Dan, who's a fellow postdoc in the lab um, with me, with, with Alex, and the man himself, Alex, uh, progenitor of all these different models that I showed you at the very beginning, supervisor of this work, and just generally all around fantastic guy. So thank you so much for having me. This was a joy, and I look forward to your questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So Justin's asking, can you calculate these metrics on photographs of real people or do you do you have to get human ratings? So because we've already gotten all these human ratings and we've trained all these models, we can get uh, metrics from the models. So the models can, can read out scores basically from the photographs of faces. Um, it's not 100% accurate, of course, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> The, the gold standard is to use real people's ratings, um, but yeah. Others? I, there's another a comment from Li Wang. She says, uh, could this be used to train doctors and people to look more trustworthy or empathetic? Yes, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. So you could imagine either training people to look more empathetic or um, bypassing that in a way, short-circuiting that by basically putting a mask on their face that looks more empathetic, like a filter, right? Like a think of like a Snapchat filter that makes you look a certain way. Um, and it's a question of whether or not that's a, the, the latter approach is a good thing, or even the former approach is a good thing, right? There's the appearance of empathy, and then there's actually being empathetic, right? <laughs> I think the best way to, to look empathetic would be to be empathetic. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the appearance matters too, so I don't know. What else? Okay. Um, Justin's asking, how are you going to keep these WM? <laughs> how are you going to keep these WMD out of the hands of politicians? <laughs> <laughs> well, the WMD was Photoshop. Right? <laughs> the WMD was really uh, was really Photoshop and Adobe Premiere and all these other techniques that allow you to do CGI and manipulate faces and cinematography and and everything. So the incremental harm to politics, I think, is relatively low. Um, there. Uh, there are, of course, the likes of deep fakes. That's another kind of WMD. I didn't make that WMD. My work is more saying these technologies exist here. They're here for good. So we might as well use them for good. <laughs> that's, that's my approach. Yeah. So, so Stefan, I think that's right. But we know that people always find ways to do nefarious things. So when you look at this technology, you see where it could go. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you feel might be some uh, like uh, counterbalances to it? What are some ways that we could counterbalance the potential sort of misuse of these technologies? Um, so one way that we have in our own stuff when we release the API is uh, sort of watermarking the images. So trying to uh, make it so that anyone with a little bit of training in digital forensics can tell that this image was created and manipulated using these techniques. Um, you don't want to be in a position where every image out there has been manipulated in some way. That's kind of the world we live in right now, but we'd like to claw that back somehow, right? Um, another is trying to limit access. So, I mean, this is, as uh, when we release the API, it'll be limited to people within the scientific domain, right? You need an, a .edu address for this stuff. But it's the case that these techniques have been out there for many, many years. Even if we never came out with this, this study last year, the techniques were all there. You could, an, a, a, a motivated actor with a little bit of money could make these kinds of models themselves. Um, so I'm still grappling with how best to prevent harms outside of the stuff that we control ourselves. I think that's an important way to go, but there's lots of work to be done there. And I would honestly like to have a student or something who can work on that problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Richard is asking, do you have any data on cultural variation on perception of characteristics? Yes. Um, I personally do not, but there are, there are groups that do. So there was a, a recent paper. If you look at um, 
Alex's website, tlab.uchicago.eu, under publications, there's a 2021 review of this stuff. Um, there was basically a giant psychological, acceler psychological science accelerator study looking at cultural variation in these kinds of ratings, right? Looking at cultural variation in these models of trustworthiness, dominance, et cetera. Um, and long story short is there are some variations, but not as much as you'd think. Um, but Alex's paper details all of that. Basically, he, he and the Psychological Science Accelerator had a little bit of a, a, a spat in that regard um, because the correlation structure is, is pretty much exactly the same regardless of whether you look at the US or the Middle East or East Asia or whatever have you. So it's, it's by and large pretty shared. And I don't know if that's due to, you know, deep innate properties of how we see faces or if that's just globalization uh, you know, you know, US hegemony forcing everyone to watch the Avengers that's doing this. Um, but, but it seems pretty, uh, pretty standardized across world regions. There are going to be domains that I think, you know, are going to be highly culturally specific, right? Like, there are words in other languages that we don't have in English to describe emotional states that we don't describe in English. I'm sure that those models are going to be extremely culturally specific. But for something like happy, or friendly, maybe not. Yes. Khan asks, uh, can these metrics calculate or differentiate genuine expression versus acting expression? That is a great question. To do that, you would need ground truth data. You would need ground truth data. These projects that I've shown you here could not do that in principle because we don't have ground truth data. In fact, all the faces that I showed you in the latter half of the talk don't exist. They couldn't have ground truth data to begin with. Um, so what you'd need is you'd need videos of people, real people, say, engaging in conversation or delivering a stand-up routine or something, and then reporting after the fact as they watch the video of themselves how they felt at each moment, right? And say, oh, yeah, this moment I really was genuine. Given those kinds of data, which are hard to get, uh, you could train models that did do that. But right now, I don't have that. If you want um, to know more about emotion in particular, there's a guy, Alan Cohen. He has a company called Hume AI. They just raised another giant seed round, um, I think Series A, 12.7 million. Um, they do emotional expression recognition. Uh, so they are like at the, the cutting edge of this stuff. But my stuff is at a level higher than that. When I say high, I don't mean better. I just mean in terms of abstraction. My stuff is about first impressions, um, of which emotions are a part of that, but are not the only thing. Yeah. Abel? I uh, just was curious, you met with that last point you made. Um, are you obviously this has huge implications um, in the marketing space, like on the product side? Mm. And are you seeing like a, any, maybe it's, you might not notice any trends occurring, or like where the investments are happening in the space? Like, like who's really sort of trying to move in this area and what direction are they trying to go? Yeah. I mean, generative AI is the, is the way forward right now. Um, people are trying to, are still exploring and grappling with the implications of these kinds of models, be it GANs, be it stable diffusion. Um, and they're trying to figure out ways to harness these models to uh, increase the offerings and the click-through rates and whatever have you. That's kind of the way that it's going. I see it potentially going the way of being a really great design tool. Um, if you want to iterate through many different possible ideas for an ad or for models for an ad, you can, you can use these tools for that, right? Um, uh, also for personalized, well, I shouldn't say personalized, that's, that's, a, that's another level down, but for demographic or region targeted ads, right? You've got a model that posed for a given shoot, for a given ad for a bank, say, and that works well for the Midwest, but maybe it doesn't work for, the, for New York City, or maybe it doesn't work for a particular zip code within New York City. So then you can take that model and reskin them to become whatever you need for that particular. Uh, group. I think that's the direction it's going to go as well. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We so we we would tell them about these things. It is the case that the pictures right now are stored. Um, because what happens is when you go to the, the photo booth, you take the picture, you, you get the, the photos manipulated, and then you can download your, 
uh, your photo reel of all the different pictures that uh, are there. I need to go in and like set up like an automatic clearing of that. Um, I have never, I'm the only person with access to them. I'll just say that. I'm the only one. Um, it's been locked down beyond all reason. And I've never used them or looked at them because I don't, we haven't gotten like any particular like uh, special clearance to do that for research purposes or anything. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the idea. That's, that's where it's at. Now people are told um, what's going on with it to my knowledge. What questions? Uh, we have one from one on one. Um, Noreen asks, how is the public going to be able to discern between AI and non-AI? What are implications for regulation? Yeah. Um, so there was also a recent PNAS study basically showing that people have a hard time doing that. Uh, the faces in, from these kinds of models already look super, super realistic. Um, I think that we're going to need to implement good watermarking on these kinds of things. It is a case that things are not yet perfect. So if you train people, it, it would take about 15 minutes for you to learn how to differentiate between the real faces versus not. Let me show you an example um, of a tell for these models in particular. So one tell, if you look at the right hand image, at the bottom right corner of the image is like some weird kind of white fuzzy looking thing. Um, there are these kinds of blemishes that appear in these models more often than not. You can also look at the ears. The ears often um, have asymmetrical or unusual looking earrings, um, regardless of gender. Uh, and in our case, we were very particular. We, we, we also use these models, not just because they're good, but because there already exist great tools to tell if they're fake or not. So you can actually install a browser extension right now on Chrome that will tell you whether or not an image is fake or real. It's trained using those models. So there's no additional work that we personally need to do for these models that we're using. But for others, it's definitely a serious concern. Um, I think that in general, model makers are going to have to be responsible and make it so that you've got ways of watermarking these images so you can tell what is and isn't real. Um, because we're not yet at the point where we can do more than like headshots or something. I guess stable diffusion can do all kinds of bodies and stuff too, but then the hands get all messed up. Um, body forms get all messed up. You get some crazy things. Um, but eventually they're going to get better and better and better and better until they're completely indiscernible from reality. This is an arms race. Um, generation generally beats detection in these kinds of arms races. But if you are a company like Google or Facebook or open AI or something, you should be, I believe, required to watermark the images so that it's shown that if you made it with these tools that you, you, you know what the provenance um, of the images are. There are gonna be people that don't do that and they make their own models and they train that, but we, we can't be the ones to do that. Um, Ronald asks, rather than photos, might short videos provide more or richer information? Yes, they would definitely provide more and richer information. I think it may even be possible to tell some of the, so, I mean, ultimately, I think the physiono physiognomist trap is that they try to tell these grand, uh, they try to make these grand predictions about what people are like solely on the basis of face structure or shape or something or off the basis of one photograph. I don't think that's possible at all. But if I put you in a room with someone for 15 minutes and you can probe them and ask them questions and interview them and stuff, I think you can get a sense of what people are like. Um, so yes, short videos are going to be more informative, um, getting those data is harder and I don't have expertise in video processing stuff. So I have not done that, but eventually it would be nice to do that. <laughs> great. Other questions? Well, I'd like, I'd like to thank, uh, Dr. Udenberg for his great presentation and uh, fantastic Q and A. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And just a heads up, so um, for folks uh, who are interested in this topic, this intersection of AI and societal implications, we are hosting another joint session uh, on the 16th, I think it is, Thursday the 16th at noon, uh, about Let's Chat GPT. I think we all have heard about it, and so we'll be having a panel discussion, but really it's an open discussion. So it's a chance for this wider community to have an open discussion about the implications of, in this case, the chatbot, AI-enabled chatbot on healthcare in particular. So I look forward to having you all there. Thanks.